Hello and welcome to another tube teardown. Today it's time to tear apart the EZ80 double diode rectifier vacuum tube, which I got right here. Now again you may have noticed that this tube has an intact glass envelope, but the tube is broken nevertheless. Why? Well, you may just make out that the cathode is not really in the middle, it's bent out of shape and there's pieces falling off from it. Why did that happen? Well, we'll be looking at that in a moment. Actually, it's a problem that can be quite common nowadays, if you're using vacuum tubes. So it's something to look out for. So if you're curious what that is, then keep watching. Now we have a closer look at the tube, and you can see that part of the cathode is missing. There's actually a spot here, which should be white. And also the cathode is not in the center. So you can see that it's shifted out of alignment from the center of the tube. It's now quite obviously on the right side of the anode. Another thing we can notice about this tube is that the anode is not really the same color all around. You can see here on the bottom that there are some discolorations and maybe in some other places also we will see better when we take the tube apart. So time to take the glass envelope off. But why do you need a rectifier in a radio or any other sort of electrical equipment? The problem is that your supply voltage, the initial supply, which is coming from the main supply, is AC, but your circuit needs a DC voltage. So you need to go from the AC to a DC with a circuit of some kind. Now there's two main types of rectifiers. First, let's look at the half wave. The name actually comes from rectifying only half of the input waves. So we can see that taking our input AC, we only rectify half of it using a single diode. This is actually the type of circuit that you can see in the specific radio schematic that I'm working on. Now why would you do this instead of using a full wave rectifier? Well, it's for, for cost reasons. First of all, you only need a single diode, you don't need any more. Secondly, the transformer. To have a full wave rectifier, you would need a bit more windings, as we will see in a moment. In this case, you only need a single winding, which is also used to supply the transformer, and from this you can actually rectify it and then get on with your circuit. So the transformer construction is much much simpler. What are the disadvantages in this case? Well, the output ripple will be much larger. Since you're only rectifying half of the voltage, in the time period between the two peaks, your circuit is being supplied from the capacitor. And this will give you a nice falling slope. Then you get Again, the diode's conducting, and then another falling slope. So you will need very large capacitors to keep this voltage variation as small as possible. So, I have broken through the tube yet again. Let's see how fast the upper layer of reactive metals will change this time, if it's any faster than last time. But it seems that it's just like before. It's taking quite a while for that upper layer to react. This is mostly because of the over usage of the vacuum tube. The metals have been cooked over time and now their reaction speed has been reduced. So they're no longer as reactive as they were at the beginning. But in the meantime, I'll have to finish cutting open the glass envelope. So what happens if you want a cleaner input supply voltage? Well, you need to use full wave rectification. This is the most common type of rectification used nowadays, and also in all the higher end vacuum tube radios, this was implemented. Now, there's two ways of doing this. One is using a rectifier bridge with four diodes, and the other one is using double the input voltage with a center tap, and using only two diodes. Now, with vacuum tubes, the second version was used. We can see a schematic of it right here. In here we have both of the diodes in the same tube, just like our EZ80, and the cathode is common and is used to charge up the first capacitor and then so on. So why use two diodes instead of four? Well, when talking about vacuum tubes, making two more diodes is more expensive than making another winding on your transformer. So, I think I managed to cut the tube completely. As you can see, the upper coating is still not completely reacted, there's still a, but a bit of it that's left shiny. And it's time to remove the tube from the glass envelope. 
there we go now we can clearly see how much residue is on the inside of the glass so this glass tube should be completely transparent but you can see all this black residue on the inside okay now let's look at our EZ80 vacuum tube what is that smell <laughs> so what I found here is the data sheet to the EZ80 vacuum tube now the first thing to notice is the voltage drop on the diode we see that unlike a silicon rectifier the diode starts working directly at after zero volts so you don't have a zero point something threshold but the voltage drop is very very big so if we look at the current of 40 milliamps the voltage drop will be 15 volts so we have very large power dissipations and voltage drops on vacuum tube diodes it's quite hard to describe it's like it's, it's something metallic but it's it's very strange it's I think it's the smell of the metal that was cooked because of the over usage of the tube but anyway by looking at the tube we can see the two anodes so this is one of the anodes this is the other we see the getter on top so this is where all the material that we can see on the inside of the tube so this one on the top this is where it was deposited when the tube was constructed so in these two places and then after the tube was assembled you can simply induction heat this plate the metal will vaporize and will get deposited on the inside of the tube now we can see the cathode in the middle so right in there and on the bottom of the tube we can see the connections so how it is connected to the bottom pins and we can see the very thick filament wires so this tube if I remember correctly uses 0.6 amps as filament current so now what I will try to do is remove one of the anodes and try to see exactly how the cathode looks for that I think I'll need to remove the getter maybe cut off some other pieces and then this upper isolator should come off together with one of the anodes let's see how that works now another interesting thing is actually presented in this graph here we see the typical full wave rectifier and also the coil resistances modeled and we see what kind of voltage we can expect to get at the output depending on the current and here we clearly see the problem with the vacuum tube diode in the bottom curve we can see that for an output current variation of 0 to 90 milliamps the output voltage goes from 350 volts to 250 volts so the output voltage varies based on the output current by 100 volts which is a huge amount and I'm not talking here about ripple or anything else these are the average output voltages there we go flew across the room now is there anything else left holding this thing in place I think I should also remove these little pieces of metal since these are welded here there we go and now this upper isolator comes off and to remove this upper anode I will need to cut it off from the bottom as well there we go it's off now I will try to gently remove the anode now the thing that in my opinion broke the tube we are actually looking at is this parameter I wasn't really aware of this and maybe some of you also haven't when building vacuum tube rectifiers it's very important to take care of the maximum output filtering capacitance so this being the first capacitor that you put after the vacuum tube now back in the 50s when this data sheet was made a 50 microfarad 400 volt capacitor was huge and you could very rarely find larger capacitors but nowadays 200 300 470 microfarad capacitors are quite common and since you want your amplifier or whatever to have as little noise as possible you will put a very large capacitor this can be a problem 
because by putting large capacitors you will quickly exceed peak current that your tube can handle. And this can lead to the tube getting destroyed. And this is exactly what we see with our tube. Let's see the cathode beneath. And oh dear, that, that looks quite, quite bad. I think it's even melted or... I, I don't even know how to describe this. But all that damage happened before I started to take apart the tube. So that is not from me taking the tube apart. Yeah, you can see it's bent, it's melted, it's... All sorts of bad things happen to it. And this, unfortunately, is from misuse of the tube. So either excessive current was pushed through it, or the peak current was exceeded too many times. And this is what happened to the tube. So tubes are really resilient, since they're only made from bits and pieces of metal, but if you overstress them, you will destroy them. And basically, that's about it. So this is the EZ80. Not, not much to say about it, common cathode, two pieces of anode, a bit of wiring to connect everything and that's about it. So hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments and thank you for watching. See you next time, bye bye.